Hallelujah for coming on tonight, guys. Um, hope everybody's doing well. Tonight is uh, part three in a four-part series within a series um, by Dr. Sai, his Uamau Ke'ea um, presentation, um, and all of that within our, our, our overarching series uh, of Hawaiian identity, which we started um, some weeks ago with Dr. Harmon and his lovely wife, Pele. Um, so just a quick um, introduction to Dr. Sai, uh, and then we're going to Pule, uh, and then we'll turn it over to, to Keanu. Um, Keanu Sai holds a PhD in political science, specializing in Hawaiian constitutionalism and international relations, and is a founding member of the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics. He served as lead agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom in arbitration proceedings before the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, Netherlands, from November 99 to February 01. Um, he served as the agent in the complaint against the United States of America con uh, concerning the prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, filed with the United Nations Security Council on uh, July 5th, 2001, Dr. Sai's articles on the status of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, the arbitration case and complaint filed with the United Nations Security Council has been published in the American Journal of International Law, Chinese Journal of International Law, and oh, the Hawaiian, and the Hawaiian Journal of Journal Law, and, law politics. and Politics. Um, we are we are honored to have Dr. Sai on with us, um, the expert in in. Um, in the occupation, uh, current occupation of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, as you will, as you guys have been hearing about in uh, his first two pieces, and that we're going to continue tonight. Um, before we give Dr. Sai the floor, I'd like to ask um, our kahu, uh, Dr. Harmon, to uh, open us in Pule. Oya, aloha kako, le hokmalu, e hokmalu kako ma mua o ka vehe ana a i kia papahana kau kasai. Le hokmalu kako, au hea oe ka makua malani o kia ke kai o kau po e keiki. E milani ane a oe, hoonani ane a oe ka makua, ka mei hani na mea pau ma ka lani a me ka honua. Ne ka makua hali umai oe ko pepe au i ka mako leo pule o mako. Ka po e ala kai o keia a uh, kia hui o kanaka pova vai uh, na ohana na alapa me kia kane na oao o kauka sai e a uh, ho ulu ana i kia ike maloko mako no le o oi pume mako e kamakua a uh, maloko o kia va a uh, i ulu ae ko mako ike no kia mea o ke ano Hawaii ka piko u Hawaii a uh, i ulu ae kia mea o ka haeheo no ka aina I ulua e ka ike, no ka hanana kupuna, ka oi pume mako ma ka mako mauhana pau, nau noe kia i maia mako, nau noe aloha maia mako, nau noe alaka i maia mako, e oki ho o ka avale i nga mea meikai ole, e malama mako i nga mea meikai, nga mea nani. Le oko mako ho o meikai ana ia oi ka ho o hui ho, ana maia mako no kia hui ana i kia po, o kia ka mako leo pulea oe, maka ino ka o keiki, um, Dr. Sai, the floor is yours. Okay, mahalo, Brennan. Okay, like Brennan said, uh, this is the third of a four-part series. And in the beginning, the first session was focusing on terminology and how important it is. And the second session was on how the Hawaiian Kingdom actually operated as a constitutional monarchy. And then this presentation is now getting into what happened in 1893, right? But a lot of people think that what happened in 1893 started with the US Marines landing. In fact, it goes back. It goes back to what has been called the Bayonet Constitution of 1887. So I'm still gonna continue that constitutional governance aspect, but it's gonna move into uh, the landing of the Marines and the eventual overthrow of the government. And what exactly is the current situation using the correct terminology 
with our situation going on here, which is an American occupation that has gone on for 130 years. So with that, uh, let me go to my PowerPoint. Uh, share screen. Okay. All right. Okay, Vernon, can you see the, the PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. All right. So this uh, presentation is titled The Illegal Overthrow of the Government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Now, in 1875, King Kalako negotiated a reciprocity treaty agreement, a trade agreement with the United States. Reciprocity it comes from the word reciprocal. So it's going to mean that the trade is going to be reciprocated two ways. Certain products will enter the Hawaiian market uh, duty free, which means that there would be no uh, tax placed on it as an import and that certain products in Hawaii would enter the American market duty-free, okay? Now, one of the provisions was that Hawaiian sugar would enter the, Amer the American market duty-free. Up to 1884, Hawaiian sugar production was a lucrative business. American sh sugar producers who could not compete against Hawaiian sugar as a result of the aftermath of the Civil War that outlawed slavery protested the continuation of the treaty, which would last until 1885, unless an agreement was made to extend it. So it was a 10 year uh, agreement. Now, the purpose of a, of a tariff, right? So when a company places a tariff on a product entering the American market or any market. Butch out here? Putting an extra tax or okay. that has to be made by, by that, that company that individual bringing and you know uh, uh, introducing that product to the United States. Let's say um, under American law to to process uh, linen from cotton, right? That production it would cost let's say an American company let's say five five dollars to complete so much of that linen as a final product. So let's say $5 to make 25 boxes of linen, right? Now, if a foreign company can make linen with cotton cheaper and they can make it at $3 for 25 boxes, if that, that country allows that type of product to enter, let's say in the American market, everyone is gonna buy that foreign product because it'll be cheaper to purchase. So what the, the tariff is, that international tax, is they would have to put it so that there's an equal footing on competition. So the foreign company that only pays $3 to produce linen for 25 boxes, but it takes an American company five dollars. The, the the country would place a two dollar uh, tariff on that product, which means that person bringing in that product will have to come up and pay that tax so that there's an equal footing. So that that's what a, a tariff is. Okay, this reciprocity treaty was a negotiation between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States to allow certain products entering into each of their, their markets duty-free, and they listed them. And one of those products was Hawaiian sugar. Now, producing Hawaiian sugar in the Hawaiian Kingdom was a lot cheaper after the Civil War because there are no, there are no more slaves, right? So everyone was purchasing in America Hawaiian sugar because it was cheaper and the people back home were getting very rich okay so so basically uh it placed the, the, the American sugar producers in a position of protest meaning why is the government continuing to let foreign sugar come in that's undercutting them and that's uh what this section is talking about now in 1884 the United States offered extending the treaty on condition 
of an exclusive lease to Pearl Harbor to be used for recalling American ships. So the American administration was telling the American sugar producers that you folks will be able to open up the market and sell sugar to the East because we are going to try to secure Pearl Harbor as a recalling station for American ships. So that's how they, that's what was going on at that time. Now, Kalakaua, under Hawaiian law, needed the approval of the Hawaiian legislature in order to extend the commercial treaty. In both the 1884 and 1886 legislative sessions, the legislature blocked it because it did not like the condition of exclusively leasing Pearl Harbor to the United States. This emboldened the sugar industry to walk down the path of treason in Hawaii, driven by greed. During the summer of 1887, while the legislature was out of session, a minority of subjects of the kingdom and foreign nationals met to organize a revolution and takeover of the government. The driving motivation was sugar and began to justify their actions by stating with the lie that the native was unfit for government and his power must be curtailed. The group made demands on Kalakaua, including an immediate change of the king's cabinet ministers. This would include the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of the Interior, the Attorney General, and the Minister of Finance. Under threat of violence on July 1st, 1887, the king reluctantly agreed to form a new cabinet ministry made up of members of the group that would fill those four uh, positions of the cabinet. On that day, each member of the new cabinet took an oath to support the constitution and laws and faithfully and impartially to discharge the duties of their office. Unbeknownst to the king, however, the new ministry made a request to have Chief, Chief Justice Judd and Associate Justice Preston in the Hawaiian Kingdom Supreme Court to assist in the preparation of a new constitution that would strip Kalakaua of authority on July 5th, 1887 which implicated the two highest ranking judicial officials with treason. Hawaiian constitutional law provided that any change to the constitution would have to be approved by the legislature, which was still out of session and would not convene until 1888 unless the king called them into a special session. Because the separation of powers doctrine, the executive, uh, judicial and legislative branches was fully enshrined in the constitution since 1864, the king, as the chief executive, was limited to faithfully executing the law and could not enact law on its own without the legislature's involvement. On July 5th, 1887, Chief Justice Albert F. Judd and Associate Justice Edward Preston joined the insurgents and assisted in drafting the bayonet constitution. By noon on July 5th, 1887, a so-called constitution was drafted by the insurgents and laid before the king. Unbeknownst to Kalakaua that the Supreme Court was involved, he asked Chief Justice Judd, who was present, for his opinion. The judge stated to the king, you must follow the advice of your responsible ministers. On October 20th, 1887, the cabinet council ratified and approved the supplementary convention of 1884, which would extend the, uh, the reciprocity treaty. Another seven, it would extend it to another seven years and give the United States an exclusive lease to Pearl Harbor. This exclusive lease was also a violation of international law's most favored nation clause in the treaties with other countries and a source of growing tension with these other countries, in particular, Great Britain. Charles Gulick, the former Minister of the Interior from 1883 to 1886 concluded that the ready acquiescence of the King to their demands seriously disconcerted the conspirators as they had hoped that his refusal would have given them an excuse for deposing him and a show of resistance, a justification for assassinating him. Then everything would have been plain sailing for their own little oligarchy with the sham Republican Constitution. The so called Bayonet Constitution, the so called 1887 Constitution, came to be known as the Bayonet Constitution 
and was never submitted to the Legislative Assembly for approval. It was drafted by a select group of 20 individuals and effectively placed control of the legislature and the cabinet in the hands of individuals who held foreign allegiances. As such, and this is important, it is not a matter of Hawaiian law, but rather legally viewed as a situation of facts that are tied to the law of treason. So, so that's why you have the word bayonet in front of the constitution. A bayonet means a knife that you fix at the tip of a, of a rifle, right? So just that name alone reflects the illegality, but it's not considered a law because only the legislative assembly has that authority to change the constitution. Tiana, Tiana, you got muted somehow. Okay. Okay. Now, now we can hear you. We lost you right after um, explaining the bayonet constitution. Okay. Okay. So unlike Commandment the Fifth, Kalakaua, as the chief executive, did not have the constitutional authority to abrogate and then subsequently promulgate a new constitution without legislative approval. The constitution of 1864 no longer had the sovereign prerogative of Article 45 under the 1852 constitution. Thus, the crown was limited to faithfully executing Hawaiian law as the country's chief executive. In his speech at the opening of the Legislative Assembly in 1864, Commandment V explained and justified his action under Article 45 of the 1852 Constitution. He stated that the 45th article that reserved to the sovereign the right to conduct personally in cooperation with the Kuhinanui or the Premier, but without the intervention of a ministry or the approval of the legislature such portions of the public business as he might choose to undertake. The 1864 Legislative Assembly appointed a special committee to respond to Commandment the Fifth's opening speech of the new legislature. The committee recognized the constitutionality, the legality of Commandment the Fifth's action and stated, this prerogative converted into a right by the terms of the 1852 Constitution, your majesty has now parted with both for yourself and successors. And this assembly thoroughly recognizes the sound judgment by which your majesty was actuated to the abandonment of a privilege, which at some future time might have been productive of untold evil to the nation. So what this legislative assembly stated in 1864 it was directly tied, in this case, to the actions taken in 1887. So the legality or the laws of the Hawaiian kingdom would prevent any changes to the constitution only by authority of the legislature and no longer the authority of a monarch, right? And that's important. So from a constitutional standpoint, the Bayonet constitution is not a law, but a situation of fact, which is measured by the law of treason. Now in 1890, the Congress enacted the McKinley Tariff Act that provided that all foreign sugar, not just Hawaiian sugar, but all foreign sugar entering the American market would be duty free. So now Hawaiian sugar has to compete against other foreign sugar as well as the American sugar producers. This forced the Hawaiian sugar to compete with foreign sugar in the American market. A seed was planted in the minds of the insurgents to find an opportunity to be annexed to the United States. On November 25, 1890, King Kalako was departed for San Francisco. On January 20, 1891, the king died and his body returned to Honolulu on the 29th. That same day, Lili Okalani 
was sworn in as queen. President Harrison sent John Stevens to the Hawaiian Kingdom as the U.S. minister. In 1892, the Annexation Club was formed by the insurgents with the support of U.S. Minister Stevens. After the government was overthrown on January 17th, Stevens sent a dispatch to the State Department on February 1st. The Hawaiian pear is now fully ripe, and this is the golden hour for the United States to pluck it. When they overthrew the government, with the protection of U.S. Marines, everyone in government stayed in place except for the Queen and her cabinet and the head of the police force, Marshal Charles Wilson. The insurgents, Sanford Dolan, replaced them in their offices, and they forced everyone to sign oaths of allegiance to the new regime who were being protected by the U.S. Marines, right? Now, there is a song that you folks may have heard, and I'm sure you heard, uh, Kalana Napua. So actually, the title is Mele Aloha Aina, uh, the Patriot song. So this is where the Royal Hawaiian Band, which is part of the government, refused to sign the Oath of Allegiance. Okay. And as a result, they asked Mrs. Prendergast, a lady in waiting for Lili Okalani, to compose a song that would reflect their defiance. And that's the song Mele Aloha Aina, which we know today as Kaulana Napua, but many have not heard the English lyrics or well, the English translation of the lyrics. So this is a sample of the um, um, Oath of Allegiance that was signed. So in this case, this guy named William Larson, age 35, a native of Denmark, residing at Honolulu, and William Larson is a police officer in Honolulu. Do solemnly swear in the presence of Almighty God that I will support the provisional government of the Hawaiian Islands promulgated and proclaimed on the 17th day of January, 1893. Not here by renouncing, but expressly reserving all allegiance to any foreign country now owing by me. So that guy signed it, but the Royal Hawaiian Ban refused. And this is the song. We do 
of value. A government sums of money. We are satisfied with our stone. The astonishing food of the land. We back the new London, who has won the rights of the land. And now we tell the story again of the people who love their land. We will not rest until we have our lands. Now we're going to take a look at what happened from a legal standpoint. Now. Okay, so Judge Green, the International Court of Justice, stated that traditional international law was based upon a rigid distinction between the state of peace and the state of war. Countries were either in a state of peace or state of war. There was no intermediate state. Acts of war, specifically acts of war, triggers a state of war. And a state of war includes belligerent occupation. And this is reflected in the two volumes of international law written by the renowned expert Lasse Oppenheim. Volume one, peace. Volume two, war and neutrality. So there are certain laws that apply during peace and there are certain laws of the international law that applies during war. By direction of Hawaii's Queen Nilikwa Kalani, President Cleveland, in March of 1893, initiated the investigation of the overthrow of the Hawaiian government on January 17th. On December 18th, 1893, 11 months later, the president reported to the Congress his findings and conclusions of the investigation. He told the Congress that on the 16th day of January, 1893, between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, a detachment of Marines from the United States steamer Boston with two pieces of artillery landed at Honolulu. By the way, January 16th is a Monday. The men, upwards of 160 in all, were supplied with double cartridge belts filled with ammunition and with haversacks and canteens and were accompanied by a hospital corps with stretchers and medical supplies. President Cleveland then, then concluded, this military demonstration upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. The president making this statement to the Congress on record in the public, in the public eye, he accepted the fact that the queen was correct, that the invasion was an act of war, triggering a state of war. According to Professor Greenwood, once in a state of war, the law of peace ceased to apply between the two states and the relations with one another became subject to the laws of war, while the relations with other states not party to the conflict became governed by neutrality. And Professor Venturini says, if an armed conflict occurs, the law of armed conflict must be applied from the beginning until the end when the law of peace resumes in full effect, which will be under a treaty. So here's Queen Lilith Okalani's conditional surrender to the United States. She stated, I, Lilith Okalani, by the grace of God and under the constitution of the Hawaiian kingdom, Queen, do hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian kingdom by certain persons 
claiming to have established a provisional government of and for this kingdom. That I yield to the superior force of the United States, whose minister plenipotentiary, His Excellency John Stevens, has caused United States troops to be landed at Honolulu and declared that he would support the provisional government. She then concluded, now to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps the loss of life, I do this under protest and in peril. By said force, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall upon the facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representatives and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of the Hawaiian Islands. President then Cleveland also then stated to the Congress, this wrongful recognition by our minister placed the government of the queen in a position of most perilous perplexity. On the one hand, she had the possession of the palace of the barracks and of the police station and had at her command at least 500 fully armed men and several pieces of artillery. Indeed, the whole military force of her kingdom was on her side and at her disposal. In this state of things, if the queen could have dealt with the insurgents alone, her course would have been plain and the result unmistakable. But, the, but uh, President Cleveland then told the Congress, but the United States had allied itself with her enemies, had recognized them as the true government of Hawaii, and had put her and her adherents in the position of opposition against lawful authority. She knew that she could not withstand the power of the United States, but she believed that she might safely trust to its justice. President Cleveland also concluded that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. And then he concluded by an act of war, the government of a friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. Now, international law requires a treaty of peace in order to transform the state of war to a state of peace. But there is no such treaty of peace. Under international law, the military overthrow of a country's government does not equate to an overthrow of the country called the state. According to Professor Brownlee, after the defeat of Nazi Germany in the Second World War, the four major allied powers assumed supreme power in Germany in 1945. The legal competence of the German state, its independence and sovereignty did not, however, disappear. What occurred is akin to legal representation or agency of necessity. The German state continued to exist, and indeed the legal basis of the occupation depended on its existence. So in the case of Hawaii, the Hawaiian Kingdom State was recognized in 1843, November 28th. And that sovereign state, its authority was exercised by a constitutional government, a constitutional monarchy. That government was illegally overthrown by the United States, acknowledged by President Cleveland, but the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government did not mean the Hawaiian Kingdom ceased to exist as a state. It would continue to exist despite not having a government. So customary international law in 1893 obligated the United States as the occupying state to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom and not the laws of the United States when they are in effective control of the territory. This obligation is now codified under Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Regulations and Article 64 of the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention. Now in 1824, the US Supreme Court in American Insurance Company versus Cantor stated that the holding of conquered territory is mere military occupation and its fate shall be determined at the Treaty of Peace. If it be ceded by the treaty, the acquisition is confirmed and the ceded territory becomes a part of the nation to which it is annexed. So before you can claim to have annexed territory from a foreign country under the laws of war, you have to have a Treaty of Peace. Without a Treaty of Peace, you can't annex anything then annexation becomes more of a unilateral act of one country just saying, I got you, not annexed territory as a result of a treaty that ceded that territory. Again, terminology. The U.S. did not administer Hawaiian Kingdom law and instead unilaterally annexed the Hawaiian Islands in 1898 
during the Spanish-American War. The Congress claimed that the annexation by a congressional act was a military necessity in order to fight the Spanish in Guam and the Philippines. There is no peace treaty between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States. Now, under international law, annexation of a state without its consent is unlawful. According to the Handbook of Humanitarian Law in Armed Conflicts, the international law of belligerent occupation must therefore be understood as meaning that the occupying power is not sovereign, but exercises provisional and temporary control over foreign territory. The legal situation of the territory can be altered only through a peace treaty. International law does not permit annexation of territory of another state. So how does a state acquire the territory of another state under international law? Well, according to Professor Oppenheim, the leading expert in international law, he states that the cession of state territory is the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a cession can be effected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the ceding and the acquiring state. Here we have two sovereign states represented by their governments. One government will cede territory to another, which could be during a time of peace or as a result of war. So here's the United States of America and the British colonies were only there on the Eastern coast of the Americas. How did the United States get all of that territory that reaches out to the West, to the Pacific Ocean? Well, that came about through treaty, treaty of session. And that first treaty was signed with the French in 1803, came to be known as the Louisiana Purchase. So prior to 1803, that territory there used to be under French sovereignty and French law. After 1803, it came under American law and American sovereignty. That was followed in 1819 when Spain ceded its territory that we know today as Florida to the United States followed by the British in 1846. And then in 1867, Russia ceded Alaska. These sessions were all done during a state of peace. But, the, but what we know today as California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas, that was actually acquired as a result of war. And that was the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the Mexican-American War, transferring Mexican territory northern Mexican territory to the United States. So what is the authority of Hawaii session? How did the Hawaiian Kingdom become a part of the United States? Well, it's called a joint resolution to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. This resolution agreed upon by the House and Senate and signed into law on July 7, 1898 by President McKinley is an American law. It's called a municipal law enacted by the Congress. It is not a treaty. Now, according to Senator William Allen in 1898, when they're debating whether or not Congress could pass a law annexed in a foreign country, he stated that the Constitution and the statutes are territorial in their operation. That is, they cannot have any binding force or operation beyond the territorial limits of the government in which they are promulgated. In other words, the Constitution and statutes cannot reach across the territorial boundaries of the United States into the territorial domain of another government and affect that government or persons or property. He then concluded, the joint resolution of annexation is ipso facto null and void. Well, nevertheless, the United States wanted Hawaii as a military outpost to protect the American West Coast from invasion. So they, want, they wanted Hawaii from the very beginning, and they wanted Pearl Harbor. So in, 18, in 1900, the United States Congress passed another law creating a government for the territory of Hawaii. And all they did was change the name of the governmental infrastructure of the Hawaiian Kingdom. They changed it to the name, the territory of Hawaii. And then in 1959, the US Congress passed another law, not a treaty, but a law, changing the name of the territory of Hawaii to the state of Hawaii. And then in 1993, the United States Congress passed another joint resolution, like the joint resolution of annexation, 
apologizing for the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government. And this resolution is riddled with misinformation that portrays Native Hawaiians as if they are an indigenous tribal nation within the United States. But what does the United States Supreme Court say with regard to American law, right? Well, it says, it says, it stated in 1936 that neither the federal constitution nor the congressional laws passed in pursuant of it have any force in foreign territory. And operations of the nation in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. In the past, our history has always been interpreted through the American Constitution and American law, which drew upon Native Americans. When in reality, we should have been using as an interpretive lens, operates, uh, uh, treaties, international understandings and compacts and the principles of international law. So basically what I brought into the equation through my doctor dissertation was I'm looking at Hawaii's situation and its history through international law, not through American law, because you got to be a part of the United States first to apply American law. Without a treaty, American laws have no application here, period. And when Congress, when they pass laws in Washington, D.C., you have borders. American laws have no effect beyond the borders of the United States. So all those laws that were passed by the Congress since 1898 till today are all void, has no effect there. Problem is, why is it we don't know this? <laughs> well, people back then know it. They knew it. In 1900, on October 20th, in, Maui, in a Maui newspaper, okay, in the Maui News, there was this editorial written by the editor. And, it's, and the editor says, says here, Thomas Clark, a candidate for territorial senator from Maui, holds that it was an unconstitutional proceeding on the part of the United States to annex the islands without a treaty. And that as a matter of fact, the islands are not annexed and cannot be. And that if the Democrats come into power, they will show the thing up in its true light and demonstrate that the islands are de facto independent at the present time. Now imagine that. That's 1900. And that's seven years after the overthrow of the government. People back then knew full well you need a treaty. And then this insurgent who's running the Maui News says Thomas, necessity knows no law. And it was absolutely necessary to annex the islands at the time it was done. And further, Thomas, if it becomes necessary to annex Cuba, it would be done quicker than a wink. It is but fair to give you credit for being honest in your views, Thomas, but you don't quite understand the American people just yet. Hence, you're very misleading. Basically, this guy said a lot of, he said a lot of nothing, right? But he was creating a bubble. It really wasn't working back then, but it's going to work in time. So this, you might say, was uh, the seeds of Fox News in Hoi. Just like. But why did Thomas Clark know that you needed a treaty? Well, there was a petition in 1897 against annexation that was submitted to the U.S. Senate that effectively killed the treaty. And here you got in in this on this page, which is in Wailuku, Maui, you got Thomas Clark, age 42, and you see next to his name, Hawaiian. Hawaiian point subject. He knew. Also in 1988, the U.S. Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel questioned always annexation. The Office of Legal Counsel cited constitutional scholar Professor Willoughby, who stated in this legal opinion in 1988, that the constitutionality of the annexation of Hawaii by a simple legislative act was strenuously contested at the time both in Congress and by the press. He goes on to state that the right to annex by treaty was not denied, but it was denied that this might be done by a simple legislative act. Only by means of treaties, it was asserted, can the relations between states be governed, for a legislative act is necessary without extraterritorial force, confined in its operation to the territory of the state whose legislature enacted it. The Office of Legal Counsel concluded, it is therefore unclear which constitutional power of Congress exercised 
when it acquired Hawaii by joint resolution. Accordingly, it is doubtful that the acquisition of Hawaii can serve as an appropriate precedent for a congressional assertion of sovereignty over an extended territorial sea. So the web of lies is starting to unravel. Now, why is it that we don't know this stuff? Know this? Well, implementing denationalization. Here's a statement made by Samuel Damon, one of the insurgents. He's a traitor. But at that time, he was also a trustee of the Kamehameha Schools. On the record, he stated, if, in 1895, he said, if we are ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past. Well, this is a term called denationalization under international law, which is to obliterate the national consciousness of the occupied state in the minds of school children. They won't be able to change the minds of the adults like Thomas Clark, that he's an American, but they can implement a policy of denationalization in the schools once they get full control with the support of the United States through annexation. Now, in 1919, denationalization was listed as a war crime called attempts to denationalize the inhabitants of occupied territory. Stemming from Italy's occupation of Yugoslavia in the Second World, World War, Yugoslav charge 1434 stated, apart from killing, deporting, and interning innocent persons, the Italians started a policy on a vast scale of denationalization. As part of such policy, they started a system of re-education of Yugoslav children. This re-education consisted of forbidding children to use the Serbo-Croat language, to sing Yugoslav songs, and forcing them to salute in a fascist way. Also, in the Nuremberg trials, this is the indictment okay, against Nazis that were put on trial in Nuremberg, Germany. Count three, war crimes. Germanization of occupied territories. It says here, in certain occupied territories purportedly annexed to Germany, the defendants methodically and pursuant to plan endeavored to assimilate those territories politically, culturally, socially, and economically into the German Reich. The defendants endeavored to obliterate the former national character of these territories. In pursuance of this plan, these plans, and endeavors, the defendants, Nazis, forcibly deported inhabitants who were predominantly non-German and introduced thousands of German colonists. This plan included economic domination, physical conquest, installation of puppet governments, purported de jure or lawful annexation, and enforced conscription or drafting into the German armed forces. This was carried out in most of the occupied countries, including Norway, France, Luxembourg, Soviet Union, Denmark, Belgium, and Holland. In the case of Luxembourg, Luxembourg did not resist the German invasion by the Nazis, but it was still in a state of war. That's exactly what happened here in Hawaii. So in 1906, a pamphlet titled Program for Patriotic Exercise in the Public Schools was published by the government of the territory of Hawaii to be implemented in the schools across Hawaii. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of the Hawaiian Islands to be American and to speak English, and all they're gonna be taught is American history. Well, Harper's Weekly Magazine in 1907 published an article on this brainwashing that, is take, that was taken that had taken place in the Hawaiian Kingdom. And this reporter visited three schools, Kailani Public School, which is grade one through eight, Kahumanu Public School, grade one through eight, and Honolulu High School, whose name would be changed later that year in 1907 to President William McKinley High School. So this is my tutu's generation, my grandparents' generation on both my mom and dad's side. At the command of the principal, these children at Kaiolani Public School, 600, 614 of them, I believe, at the command of the principal, they yell in unison, we give our hearts, our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. This scene shows the salute to the American flag, which flies in the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese pupils. 
The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. The term inculcate is to uh, brainwash through repetition. Now, within two generations, the national consciousness of the Hawaiian kingdom was obliterated and replaced through Americanization. Interfered with methods of education. Americanization compelled education in the English language, only taught American and not Hawaiian kingdom history. Migrated thousands of American citizens to the Hawaiian islands. Drafted Hawaiian subjects for US wars. Imposed American laws and also imposed American and administrative and judicial systems, as well as American financial and economic administration. Example, cost of living here. And then we have a propaganda of a treaty of session. They knew they needed a treaty, but this is going to be part of the denationalization. Here is a book written and published in 1899 called Hawaiian America written by Casper Whitney, and it was dedicated to Sanford Dole and Lauren Thurston, right? In this book, he writes, President McKinley, June 16, 1897, signed another annexation treaty, which was submitted to the Senate and ratified July 6, 1898, after Admiral Dewey's victory at Manila Bay had made ratification imperative. The problem is the treaty wasn't ratified. It's called a joint resolution of annexation, so that's not true. Another propaganda, 1901, publication by the United States Department of State. In it, it says, a treaty was negotiated by Secretary Foster, agreed upon by both parties and sent to the Senate by President Harrison on February 14, 1893. That is true, that's the provisional government. But the treaty was withdrawn by President Cleveland. President McKinley, Cleveland's successor, revived the question and a treaty was ratified by both parties an annexation consummated September 16, 1898, which effected the absorption of the Sandwich Islands into the domain of the United States. That's not true, but more importantly, I don't even know what happened on September 16, 1898. That's just a made-up date. Nevertheless, it's not true. No treaty. And here, another propaganda in the United States Supreme Court, a decision that came before them in Lowry versus Hawaii. It says here that the United States was a necessary party to the property described in the petition, having been transferred and ceded to the United States by the Treaty of Annexation on July 7, 1898. Another example of what is not true. It's a joint resolution, not a treaty. And propaganda, again, this is uh, a statue of William McKinley at President William McKinley High School. And in his right hand, he is holding a document. And this was dedicated, this statue was dedicated, I believe in 1911. And that document he's holding in his right hand is supposed to be the document of annexation. So let's see what it says. Let me highlight it. What is engraved there. Treaty of annexation. Notice they didn't say joint resolution of annexation because you can't annex anything with a joint resolution. Not true. As Donald James Will, also known as British novelist Dresden James once wrote, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. So my closing statements, according to Professor Cohen, the state must be distinguished from the government. The state, not the government, is the major player, the legal person in international law. And according to Judge Crawford, there is a presumption that the state continues to exist with its rights and obligations despite a period in which there is no effective government. And belligerent occupation does not affect the continuity of the state, even when there exists no government claiming to represent the occupied state. While under belligerent occupation, also called military occupation, the United States is still in a state of war with the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, let's see. So what you, what you have here is the takeaway from this presentation is, despite the illegality of the overthrow of the Hawaiian government, 
international law still recognizes that the Hawaiian kingdom still exists. And that has to be understood, right? So next presentation I'll be giving is the now what? How do you address this? But you have to know the country still exists, not that you need people to recognize it. Well, they already did in the 19th century. It still exists. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Vernon for any uh, questions. Mahalo. Hello, Nui Kiana. <clears throat> um, I, I do have a couple questions um, myself. Uh, and if you um, want to jump in here and ask uh, questions uh, of Dr. Sai, um, you can either raise your hand or you can put the uh, put your question in the chat, guys. Um, Kenna, is there? We get plenty, you know. Uh, I'm wondering what schools is teaching is teaching this in their their Hawaiian history curriculum. You know, we get plenty. You mentioned Kamehameha schools earlier. Um, we have a lot of Kamehameha schools students. You know, it is. Uh, do we know if Kamehameha schools is teaching the history and 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 you know if so, if not, and also what other what other uh, uh, schools might be teaching what you're what we learning from you in these past three presentations well there's a lot of schools teaching it uh, specifically I, I, I know I know of a few but you know there has been no tallying of which schools are actually which, which teachers are actually teaching it right but next the next presentation I'm giving is the now what because what I presented here in this presentation was not only to explain really what happened through law and political science, but also the impact and the consequences of what happened under international law. So people have been led to believe that Hawaii is a part of the United States when it's not, there's no treaty. And the evidence of that brainwashing that we that we can spot today is the use of the word ceded lands, right? So when people today say ceded lands, which is land supposedly ceded or transferred to the United States in 1898 by a joint resolution, well, why is it that we say we're saying ceded when there's no treaty? A joint resolution is a unilateral act. It's a country saying, I got you. That's not session. Session comes from the Hawaiian kingdom ceding its territory, like France did in 1803, like Spain did in 1819, like the British did in 1846, and the Mexicans in 1848. The fact that we keep saying ceded lands, crowning government lands, is a reflection of the brainwashing. That's one indicator right there. So if people don't understand always legal history, they won't be able to teach it in the classroom. <laughs> it's just going to be mishmash. It's the terminology is important, right? So um, a comprehensive plan has to be made on how do you approach this situation. And that's what's going to come up in that next presentation. These are all what I call variables in the equation, right? But the terminology has to be precise, without which you got confusion, right? In the army, we call it a Charlie Fox chart, and I'll let people figure that one out, what it means as an acronym, right? So this is an issue of due diligence and questioning everything. And, and, and that's what led into the work that I got into, which really drew upon my military training and my military background, because as a captain in the field artillery, as a field artillery officer, I was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, when the first Gulf War broke out in 1990. That was when Iraq invaded Kuwait. So I'm in Fort Sill going to also the advanced course, battle training, and we're getting live intel coming in. And we all knew, not as political scientists or legal people, we just knew as grunts. When Saddam Hussein overthrew the Kuwaiti government, Kuwait was still Kuwait, but it was being occupied. Even though Saddam Hussein in Baghdad said, oh, I just annexed you and I made you my 19th province. No, 
Our job was to expel the Iraqis. Kuwait still exists, even though the Kuwaiti government was overthrown. To me, that was the game changer for me. Because when I began to do my research and my family genealogy, when I got back from Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I quickly began to realize what was overthrown in 1893 was our government, not our country. No different than what happened to Kuwait. And that was the game changer. <laughs> That's when I went, ah. Uh -huh. And then I had to just get more information because now it would get to a point, now what? <laughs> what do you do? And I don't want to jump ahead. I want questions coming from what was covered in this presentation. But we'll be getting to a lot of the questions that may come up as a consequence, but it'll be more appropriate on, on the last presentation because that gets into the now what and the plan on how do you how do you execute a plan given a hundred and over a century of brainwashing? The law is still the law, but you're talking to people who are just talking gibberish. You know, it's like somebody would tell me one time, am I talking Greek or what? <laughs> See, yeah, you know. Bro, I didn't talk that language. So all of us right. are talking Greek. We don't even know what happened in Hawaii. We got to learn how to talk Hawaii and use the right words, the terminology, even in English. <laughs> right. Um, you you mentioned international. Um, you you've mentioned international law throughout all your presentations. What other, what other bodies are international bodies are aware of Hawaii's history? this history that you you're talking about the brainwash the denationalization was complete i mean when, when when you have your own when you have the nationals of an occupied state believing as children that they're american and they don't have a country called the hawaiian kingdom that was made complete within two generations so my tutu and my parents generation three institutionalized by the time I got to me, I come in schools out of sight, out of mind. I didn't know anything. In fact, I went to a military college to get my commission as a second lieutenant in Army Reserve, right? So, so that also had an effect on foreign countries. So basically, other countries were led to believe that Hawaii was actually annexed by a treaty. That was all the propaganda. So everybody just kind of forgot about Hawaii, even though the treaty still exists. So you're talking about the obliteration of the Hawaiian kingdom internationally, as well as locally. And you have to, like, I have to say that what the United States did in implementing that plan of denationalization, you got to respect it because it, it, it worked. And everybody here is a victim of war crimes. They don't even know that. So when you know that, that, that you have to respect it, not agree with you, you got to respect it then you know how to engage it right so it's like when i played football we used to play against st louis st louis used to run the option all the time you got to respect st louis running the option or you can't even have a defense against the option right and and what i had to come put into play was how am i going to engage these facts that have been so complete you cannot just disregard it no it affected our psyche it affected the way we think. And when people say they're Hawaiian, no, you're not. You're an American Hawaiian. That's what it is. You're an American Hawaiian, period. And just the terms coming out, I can hear it, right? Seated lands, right? Office of Hawaiian Affairs. <laughs> That's all American Hawaiian. That is not the Joseph Navahi Hawaiian of 1893. That is not the James Kaulia Hawaiian of 1893. That is not the David Kalau Kalani Hawaiian of 1893. They knew who they were. We don't. When we accept the fact that we don't know who we are, then you can learn something. When you still think you know everything, hard to be taught new information. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, that's all the questions we I see here for now, Keanu. Um, mahalo nui again for coming on tonight. Um, oh, I got a I got a hand raise. Um, question, go ahead. Hey, aloha, Dr. Keanu. Hey, aloha. Uh, 
Uh, this is the first time I tied into this meeting, and I really appreciate the information that you provided. It's opened my mind uh, to what had happened. And I am a graduate of Kamehameha Schools. I don't remember my Hawaiian history being taught on that level between annexation and uh, the, ter the term that you use. Session. But, um, Session. Yeah. Session. Yeah. So, like, just out of curiosity, I don't want to step ahead or move past your um, program for tonight, but looking ahead at land ownership, possibly as something like uh, in Lanai and as well as Nihal, uh, should things propagate in the future, what is possibly or maybe something that might go ahead as far as land ownership that was tied to United States law, how would that possibly come into effect with private ownership today? Okay, good question. And that ties to exactly what I covered, right? So I can definitely answer that question. So private ownership in Hawaii goes back to 1845, uh, where Royal Patents and Land Commission Awards were issued. Okay, so private ownership was established in 1845. And the Bureau of Conveyances was established to record uh, deeds, warranty deeds, where property are being, are being transferred or conveyed to somebody else, grantor, grantee, right? Now, under Hawaiian law, a person who acquires, let's say, a royal patent in 1853 in fee simple, let's say five acres in Wailuku, that person can convey by deed a portion of the five acres to somebody else, whether somebody who might purchase it or maybe convey it to one of their children, right? Now, when you come, when you write up a deed, it's no different than today. You write up a deed that a grantor conveys and there's a template for it, and but you have to get it notarized. In the Hawaiian kingdom, notaries were Hawaiian subjects and the function of a notary is to make sure that the person conveying the property is doing it of his own free will. He's not being coerced. He's not drunk, right? He is of sound mind and body because if the guy was drunk, that notary would not notarize because that's the function of a notary. That person would acknowledge the transfer as being legit. Once you get the notary and the seal, then you can record it in the Bureau of Conveyances. That Bureau of Conveyances still exists today. Now, the problem with transferring property in 1893 President Cleveland referred to the insurgents, not as a government, referred to them as an insurgency, right? Criminals, period, not a government, okay? And in saying that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States does not make them lawful. So then the, the point here is as a consequence of Hawaiian law, Nobody could convey property after 1893, January 17th, by simply referring to the notary. Who's the notary after 1893? Insurgent. Who's the notary in 1985? State of Hawaii notary. Well, the State of Hawaii notary authority comes from the 1959 Statehood Act passed by Congress, which is limited to American territory. You got to be a part of the United States in order for the Congressional Acts to apply. So basically, all title, everything, anything that people think they own that they acquired after 1893, they never acquired it. It's void. But the interesting thing there is people who have a mortgage actually purchase title insurance in case there's a problem like that. Because when you go to escrow, because you borrowed money from a bank, the bank won't loan you the money to purchase that property unless you bought title insurance in the amount of the money you borrow from the bank. And that's why they require you to go to escrow. And the title company is supposed to do a title search of that property. Now, how, how far back do they go? They Title guarantees say they go back 1845. <laughs> no, they don't. They go back like three conveyances. 
And then they read a report saying, oh, title's valid. And then you have an insurance company from America called Tycor Title Insurance Company underwrites that, that, that title report ensuring the accuracy of the title search. And then the insurance policy is issued to the, to the bank to hold on to just in case the report was not accurate. Because if the report was not accurate, meaning the notary was a problem after 1893, well, actually a, a defective notary, defective notary is a covered risk in title insurance. So that means that according to the contract, the insurance company pays off the loan. And then you got to go figure out how to fix your title. So you have all these consequences <laughs> from, from the legality. And I'll be kind of covering a lot of those things today on how do you fix the problem? Because the ultimate point here and why I get involved and why I got involved, I didn't get involved to waste my time. And I started this way back when, and my job is to fix the problem. I remember my tutu always told me, when you start something, don't be kapulu, right? If you're not gonna do it all the way, don't do it. And I kind of remember that, but then that's also reinforced by my officer training as a field artillery officer, battle planning. <laughs> so you can never come up with a battle plan until you get your intel right. And that's important. So what we're going through here is intel, not necessarily coming up with a plan yet. But I want to show you what the plan was that we came up with uh, in 1997 and where we've come till today. Did that answer your question, Larry? Ah, uh, yes, that did. Thank you very much. Uh, you accepting job applications? Teach at UH because this thing's got to be institutionalized, not politicized. But it's really awakening everybody's national consciousness. But how do you fix the problem without blowing this place up economically, politically? See, that is the ultimate uh, uh, objective of what not to do. So I don't. I don't have to prove and nobody, I don't have to prove everybody does not own land to, to prove a point and throw this place into chaos. But I can show why you don't know or you don't own it, but you got title insurance. But then also how you fix your title. All of that all comes into play. So I'm into fixing a problem, not exacerbating it. Because I live here too. And I'm not here to try to prove a point. <laughs> the point's already proven. I'll kupuna laid it out. Right now, <clears throat> how do you move forward on this? And that's why it's important in looking at our history. The practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow. That film never changed, but your projector got to get updated to process more film. That's the key. It's not trying to come up with an answer. No, you got to understand what happened. And so when you look at the word Hawaiian, in the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian word for future, it's kaba mahope, not kaba mamua. So kava mahope is the time of the past. Meaning when a Hawaiian says, what do I do? They turn backwards and they look at the mo'olelo and they capitalize on successes, learn from mistakes. And what you get out of that is ike. Now you see something you never see. That's how it works, right? So that's my approach on all this stuff. But I gotta tell you, our kupuna's uh, shoes are huge. And uh, we got to grow into them. It, they're huge. They, it's unbelievable, you know. But it makes me proud, but it also shows how little we know today. We got to measure up to them. And that is how we have to approach this. So very, very uh, Kuleana-oriented. I believe in maximizing Kuleana, not changing it. Just be better at who you are. And I got to be better at who I am because I got my own Kuleana. Right. You never you never stay still. You gotta keep learning. Yeah, that's the key. <laughs> okay, Larry. Hey Dr. Keanui. Right on. <laughs> uh, okay, no. Um any anyone else questions tonight? Um well I know I'm excited, Keanu, for, for the next presentation. Um and and I think I think I think most questions for our family um, uh, families on the call tonight on the presentation tonight are kind of 
you know, along the lines of of what Larry's question was, in that you know, now what, right? And, and because I think everybody, I mean, there's no happy chance we hear all of us tonight. Um, there's no happy chance, you know, our journey crossed paths with you um, some years ago, and, and and it's for me personally, it's just I've. I've been witnessing all of these paths um, mm -hmm. intertwine with each other, um, even in all the way up into tonight and then moving forward. And so uh, I'm I'm very thankful for you, uh, Dr. Sai, and uh, and thankful for all of our Ohana on tonight um, because uh, <laughs> No matter how you got here, yeah, we we here now and we're here together. And so now we're going to move forward, like Dr. Sai said, together. Um, and and I'm excited about what that means for for our, for reclaiming national consciousness, right? Remembering um, and, and rebuilding it through our youth, through our teams, through our organization. So um, mahalo again. Uh, Keanu. And uh, if no more questions, guys, um, if um, Pele, you can uh, close us in Pule. Hi, Hikino. Um, mahalo nui, kaukasai. Um, I'm, I'm just like Vern. We're very excited to hear the next, um, Ha'iolelo, the next speech about um, what our next steps are. And um, just as closing thoughts, yesterday your Ohana was at our school at Navahi, um, Kau'i and Hewa, and they brought um, Mr. Walter yeah. Riddy. He talked about um, Kuleana and, you know, when they occupied Koho'olawe and also um, a lot of similar ideas, yeah. So for the young people who are on the call and even, you know, Makua, um, that call to uh, answer our kuleana um, is so important and so this is very 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 not just enlightening but also um, I think inspiring for a lot of us yeah um, the work that you do and how you continue to educate us so with that we close tonight make a mahalo nui and e pani kako make a pule kauhane ka amene ho makokau apule amene amene everyone aloha